in high school at Grace. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's always an exciting Sunday. Might be a little louder than you're accustomed to, but that's okay. And uh, if we don't start in the next two minutes, Pastor Homer's going to hear about this, and we're going to suffer. So <laughs> worship team, come on up, and if you could stand up and get ready to worship the Lord. Okay, guys, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for giving us Sunday where we can come to church and have fellowship with each other and we can spend some time in your word. Thank you that today the youth can lead worship and we can uh, use the gifts that you have given us for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.
Welcome again to Grace. So I, I'm going to give you a little outline of what the service is like today because it's a little bit different. Um, we're going to do a worship, which we've just done. Check. Now we're going to have three people come and share uh, different things that are going on in the youth group. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, youth group members is going to share. Mr. Curtis is going to share on what's been going on in the middle school and what they've been learning and how that applies to us as adults. And most importantly, how we can support and pray for these young people. And then one of our kids is going to share. Then I will share on what's been going on with the high school. Then we're going to have another worship set at the end. So that's the order of service. So I think we should probably dismiss the young people, the, the little kids, the younger kids. If the younger kids want to go to their Sunday school class. So before Mr. Gertis comes, uh, I have a couple of quick announcements. One is, um, usually we do tithe and offering. During Youth Sunday, we don't do tithe and offering. Uh, so if you're new to the church, that's awesome. That means we don't want your money. We don't anyway, by the way, if you're new to the church. But if you are a regular attender of church, obviously the AC is kind of still on and the lights are on. If you do have tithe and offering you want to give, it goes in that box right outside the front door. So feel free to drop it in there. Um, Seems like there was another announcement. Get on the city. That's always the announcement. Um, so let's, let's uh, open in a word of prayer. I'm going to have Mr. Gertis come and share, and then we'll go from there. Uh, church service sometimes is a bit like professional development, where if you end a little bit early, that's still okay with everybody. So we'll see what the timing is when we get done. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, being here with us. <clears throat> we want, uh, God, for you to speak today to our hearts. We know that you gather with us when we gather, and we're grateful for that. And God, I just pray that through this service, ultimately, that your name would be glorified, that uh, the attention would be turned toward you <clears throat> and what you're doing in the lives of uh, all of us. And I pray, God, that uh, as these people come and share, that you would touch the hearts of those who are listening. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, Mr. Gertis is our middle school up through eighth grade uh, Sunday school teacher. So he's going to share real briefly with you. Thanks, Dan. Hey, wasn't that amazing? I love it when the youth get involved in the church, and you guys just do a fantastic job. It shows the excitement that's going on in the church and, and how people are getting involved. And uh, I, I just think it's, it's really powerful when you see the youth who are leading us, and so that's pretty cool. So in the junior high, what, are we, what have we been working on all year long? <laughs> And the kids can tell you about it, the whole book of Genesis. All 50 chapters, verse by verse, the good parts, the bad parts, and the ugly parts, and it, there's a lot of that actually in the book of Genesis. So, so why, why have we been working on that? Well, Genesis is all about origins, right? It's the origin of the universe. It's the origin of life as we know it. It's the origin of man. Um, Christ talked about the book of Genesis. Of the books that he quoted, that was one of the ones that he spent... He, he quoted quite a bit and talked about, and about, talked about being there, actually. Um, and, per, and the book of Genesis can be divided up into two sections, and that's how we, we did it. You have the first 11 chapters, pre-flood, and then you have the, the next 39. And in those first 11 chapters, and perhaps no other chapters in the Bible have a greater impact on how you think. All right? No, no other... No other chapters probably in the Bible, you've accepted Christ, but no other chapters have a greater impact on, and not just on the youth, but everyone here on how we think. When we, when we start with the first four words, in the beginning, God, right? In the beginning, God. That should have a huge impact when you just read that. This is how this all starts out. We see how God creates a beautiful, wonderful, perfect universe, how he creates life. Right now, with science, we're finding that the, the universe as we know it extends 13.8 billion light years, they see. from It's amazing. And yet there's this little blue dot somewhere in the middle of it where God decided, I'm going to create life, and I'm going to create not only man, but a relationship with man. 
And, and we see that relationship. And then we see the fall. And we see what happens after the fall. And yet, even with the fall, there's a promise of a Savior. And we see that how that occurs. And we go through that, and yet, we get promised of a Savior, and man gets kicked out of the garden, and corruption occurs. And so God decides, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wipe everything out almost and start, and start. I'm going to save one man and his family, and we're going to go from there. And yet through this all, God is faithful. He, you know, he, he gives us these covenants. And, and those covenants follow with us even today, thousands of years later. And then we go to the next, the next section. And things start off with the pride of man again. And one of the saddest chapters, I think, in the, of the Bible, in chapter 12. And how many of you guys are studying Chinese? I'm suffering through that horribly right now. We have the Tower of Babel, and I, and I accuse all those people for all my suffering right now. Had they gotten along and had they not had pride, I probably wouldn't have to suffer through Chinese right now. So we go through the Tower of Babel. And then how many of you guys um, watch soap operas or into, into, the, you know, into these new scandalous uh, television shows that are on? Let me tell you, there are no scandals greater than the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. When you read about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, it's incredible what these people do. But God is, keeps his covenant, and he's the one who's faithful with them, all right? No matter what they do, he continues his faithfulness with them. And we see um, Abraham's line, and we see Isaac's failure as a father, and Jacob's constant deceit from the beginning to the end. Even though he has conversations with the Lord, it, he still relies on his deceit to try to get his way. And then we see one of the most beautiful stories of Joseph. And you guys think you have it hard. Imagine your brother selling you into slavery, right? And sending you to another country. And you've got to start all over from the beginning. And through that all, his whole, his whole viewpoint is, you meant this for evil, but God intended it for good. And if we could all have that type of viewpoint when things happen, and this is one of the things trying to get across to the youth, is if we can have that viewpoint of what Joseph had, I don't care what bad happened. God intended this for good. How can I make this a good thing? So, with the way, what, all the things that we're finding in science, in archaeology, everything we're digging out of the ground now is just it's, it's backing up what we've, people have had faith in the Bible for years. So, it's, we, in this class, we've been tying together anything, any new discoveries that come out. How does this fit in with Genesis? And it's, I've really had a lot of fun teaching the kids this year. Now, what to pray for for them? Well, first, we're going to pray for uh, Jason Roloff, who will be taking over next year. And as he has to pick up the, you know, pick up and all the excitement he'll have that class. So I really hope that you pray, pray for Jason. Um, second, for all these eighth graders who are now heading to Dan's class, and, and may they apply what they've learned <laughs> when he starts hitting them with really tough questions. Right? And, and will that foundation that they've built, that they've seen in Genesis, will that come out with the questions that he's asking them? And then finally, just, just with all the youth, not just the, the junior high, but the, with the little kids and um, also with the high schoolers, is, is building that, that uh, personal relationship with God. We see it in Genesis. We see it from the beginning. God creates a walk in the, eat, walk in the garden relationship with Adam. And even after sin, he maintains this personal relationship. And, it, and he sends a son for us to maintain this personal relationship. And this is constantly throughout the entire book of Genesis and the Bible. And I just, my prayer is out to all the kids as they grow up in, a, in an ever-changing world that they, they maintain that and they maintain that um, in their hearts. So, thank you. So, those of you that don't know, uh, Greg and his family are moving to China next year. We're going to miss them a lot. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll send you guys off sometime in June. Yeah, good, thanks. <clears throat> All right. So, um, yeah, be praying for these middle school kids. You see them around here. They're in the back. <laughs> Just where I sat when I was in middle school. Back row of church. So, um, our second uh, person who's going to share is, is, uh, has been a total blessing in my life. Her name is Maxine. She's a senior at TAS. A lot of the high school kids who are here in our, in our youth group, you know you're here because Maxine invited you and, and strong-armed you into coming. And that's only because uh, of what Maxine, what Maxine has had done in her life by, by God. 
And so uh, she's going to share with us a little bit today about that. She's nervous. Be patient with her. Pray for her while, while you're sitting there listening. And uh, I'm excited to see what God's laid on her heart. So, Maxine. Hi, hello. Hi, so my name is Maxine, and I'm a senior at TIS, as Mr. Long has introduced me. And he has kindly invited me to share a little bit about what God has been doing in my life, and more importantly, what I've witnessed throughout my four years in high school. As I grew up in a christ center family raised by two faithful parents, um, I never got much chance to doubt the goodness of God. God has always provided for us, and uh, he always gave us more than we deserve. At school, people would refer to me as the hardcore Christian girl, which technically doesn't even make sense, but um, that's the extent to which I evangelized. Uh, people knew of my faith. In my freshman year, I stopped going to the church that my parents attended because I wanted to immerse myself in an environment where I could thrive more. And let's just say that the youth there were quite vocal about where they preferred to be 8 a.m. Sunday morning. And so I was looking for another church. Soon enough, um, after a short, short search, God has answered my prayers, and I was invited to a church at uh, Zhanzhan, which is one stop away from here, and it was a Bread of Life church. And there I grew in Christ for three more years. My experience there was truly an eye-opener. Um, in a room no bigger than where we're gathered here, there would be filled with hundred, uh, over 100 high school and college students, and they were the most charismatic and passionate Christians, first-generation Christians that I've ever seen. Many of them got down on the knees when they worshipped. Many of them spoke in tongues. And a lot of them fasted um, as a testament of faith, a devotion to prayer, but also as a way of getting by their next meals because they didn't have enough money. Despite so, they selfishly served the church every day, many of them without the consent of, of their parents because they were from traditional Chinese families. Through these brothers and sisters in Christ, I saw a new rising generation of teenagers on fire for God and empowered by God to impact other people. Although I was experiencing something special at this church, I had reached a plateau of my faith. I felt like I was not fulfilling what God wanted me to do, and there was something more out there. However, like Mr. Lopez spoke about a few weeks ago, instead of treating it as a, rest, uh, a resting stop, I treated it as a destination, and I didn't want to move on. I was really comfortable there. Later, I realized that after inviting a lot of my friends to this church, they felt really uncomfortable with the charismatic atmosphere, and um, uh, they had a hard time understanding the Chinese sermons. Um, thankfully, God wasn't about to let me get, get away with that. In my senior year, I reached a turning point in my faith. In brief context, I had a long-distance boyfriend who meant a lot to me, and it was a huge part of my life. However, through a series of events, I was led to the conviction that God, um, it wasn't God's will for me to commit to a relationship with a non-believer. It was not a straightforward, easy conclusion. I definitely was in denial and trying to fit, find loopholes um, within God's words and try to blur the lines that were pretty clear in front of me. In the end, although I tried to chase away this conviction and take control of the situation based on my own under, under, sorry, and tried to take control of the situation based on my own understanding, God stirred my heart remained, and I had to make a decision. It was one of those all-in or all-out moments. God was either there, and he, he is who he says he is, or he's not. He either has a better plan for me, or he doesn't. Um, it was definitely a leap of faith to let go of something that I could grasp with my hands for something that I couldn't see. When my relationship ended, I thought I would feel at peace and comforted by God. However, nothing felt right. I felt confused and very, very alone. On top of the typical ap aftermath of a teenage breakup, if you know what I mean, I was overcome with the doubt behind the reason why it ended. What was most discouraging was the lack of support I had around me. A lot of my non-believer friends thought I was too religious or even crazy. No one understood. Not to even mention my ex-boyfriend now, who was completely furious and turned off by God, which was probably the most heartbreaking thing for me. I didn't understand how obeying God could result in all this chaos. Right when I was at the brink of giving up, God reached out for me. I miraculously found a group of Christian friends, a group that I've been looking for all, for all these years at TAS. I 
I don't know what happened, but stop crying. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but things just fell into place. And the next thing I knew, we began, work, we began meeting each week at school together, praying and supporting each other. Furthermore, Michelle Lopez, who's here today, which makes me a lot more nervous than I should be, happened to be a temporary speaker at the Pearl Church, where I happened to be attending. Little did I know, Mr. Lopez would bring me back to what he calls the relentless pursuit of Christ. I don't think he realizes the tremendous impact he had on me as God spoke through him to me. But he reminded me that sometimes God squeezes us so hard, like a toothpaste, not so he can see what's inside of us, but so we can see what's inside of us. And for me, that would be my superficial faith in God, which was never challenged and only went through the good times, but not the bad times. And he, Mr. Lopez also left me with a sense of mission and burden with the truth, as he reminded me to not simply hold on and get by, but to push on. So as I began to see my heart transform and behavior change, I, was, I felt really troubled. If this God is really real, and um, then how come so many people don't know about him? Even people around me, my friends, how come they don't know about them? And I thought that there's no work and no academics that should be prioritized over spreading the gospel. I realized that my lack of courage and lack of knowledge to reach out to others was, in fact, very selfish. C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it can't be is moderately important. It's not just about Christ's teaching or a subjective choice of moral grounds. I began indulging myself in the word in Christian apologetics. I knew that if I wanted to bring my peers to church, I would have to have better explanations uh, than I know God is there because I can feel him. Luckily, on this intellectual pursuit of God, Mr. Long adopted me and my all too many questions uh, involving free will, salvation, hell, sin, and so much more. Although I was astonished to see how ignorant I was and finally understood why skeptics had such a hard time coming to Christ, I also saw how many well thought out, logical, and satisfying biblical answers that are out there for those who are seeking with their hearts. So soon, my miraculously new group of Christian friends and I began praying for other peers as we grew stronger together. We were burdened by the responsibility and urgency to spread the word. The next thing we knew, a lot of our friends who we prayed for and invited began accepting our invitations to church. And we saw many of them who never heard of this Christian God um, falling in love with him in front of our eyes. There were weeks when at the small pro church with no more than 50 young adults, uh, the, the attendance would increase by one third of its size with TAS students. Soon it became a cool Sunday hangout for all of us. Similarly at Grace Now, we continue to see a lot of our friends come try it out and come back again. And so to those of you who've been invited to uh, church by your friends, please know that your friends do uh, have prayed for you a long time. And it's not just simply a coincidence that you're here. And although there are definitely many times when we feel discouraged that our friends come and uh, don't like their experience here and don't come back, it hasn't stopped us from continuing to invite them. I believe that God has his perfect timing, and we're only here to plant the seeds. Recent, recently, a dear friend of mine who I've been praying for six years now accepted Christ. And along with a few others, they're preparing to get baptized next month with Mr. Long. And that alone makes every single moment of trying to reach out worth it. Can we please show this uh, the next slide? This is a project that my friends and I have been working on. And basically, we personalize Bibles. And um, so we, we would uh, highlight verses that we thought were important and maybe categorize them. So you can see there's like anger, lost, hope, suffering, burden, lust, sex, etc. And we oftentimes put notes in, in the middle of them, uh, specific verses, and we'd write something along the lines of, oh, this verse helped me through this time in my life, and I know you're going through this, this thing in your life, so I hope you can be encouraged by this. And although it's definitely a lot of work, um, it's been so much fun getting into God's work and, uh, word and working on it. And I know that when someone receives a gift that is personalized for them, they will definitely open it up and check it out, and that's all that matters. We have heard some pretty cool feedbacks from these Bibles, and I'd love to share more if you guys are interested later. 
And can we have the next slide again? This is a dance piece by Tiffany Ku. She choreographed it. And the other girl is Gracie Salinas, who is here today. And um, basically, uh, Tiffany, she was choreographing a piece and trying to capture how the trials and temptations that Christians go through, but also how God is merciful and, and picks us back up and guides us to the right way. And um, I thought it was so wonderful how, wonderful how she incorporated such a strong message through dance, a talent that God has blessed her with. And also, can I, can I have the next slide? This is my RP Surrender, which I made during that very low time of my life. And during this time, Tiffany pointed me to the book of Job in the Bible, which is basically about a blameless man who was very faithful, but had everything taken away from him, his health, his family, his property. Yet he remained so faithful, and he said, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Blessed is one whom he corrects, for he wounds but also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heals. So as this story resonated in my heart, I wanted to express it through art. I immediately thought of a brother in Christ who is part of this miraculous fellowship group that God blessed, with, blessed me with this year. This brother understood more than anyone else what it was like to surrender his life to God as his father passed away two years ago. Yet his courage and faith in God was so contagious. So he so willingly got down on his knees and modeled for my peace. And as you can see, he did a really good job. Later, this piece was chosen to travel um, to an IASIS exhibition in Manila. Along with my artist statement, which explained the heart behind that momentous decision to surrender my life to God. The, pe the best part of all of this is the kind of conversations that the piece stirred up. It all began during my art critique when I first brought the piece out for the first time and I didn't know what to expect and I didn't know what other people would think of it. But I remember I cried and I told everyone about it. Although I'm sure that a lot of people in my class thought I was kind of crazy, but later on, there were more conversations coming up and people began emailing me, people from Manila began emailing me, and I, I made so many new friends and I was given so many opportunities to talk more about God. And I know that with all these young, talented people down here, um, God wants to use you and your talents to do amazing things for him. And lastly, I just want to end with a prayer request with all the adults. Being of the Christian faith in the secular world is very difficult, and sometimes it just seems so much easier to give in and give up uh, with the ways of this world. And to finish this very hard race, we need patience, courage, and love. Patience to communicate with those who disagree with our beliefs or despise our beliefs. Courage to stand up for our beliefs anyways, and love to, to um, just bring others closer to God. It, it's truly been difficult to live not of this world, but in this world. And on behalf of all the seniors here, we could really use your prayers as we are about to step into a world of relativism, skepticism, and a lot of temptation. So thank you all for your attention and this opportunity to share. I'm sure that the trials I've been through is, are nothing compared to the ones you guys may be going through today, but I'm eternally grateful to be squeezed so hard by God so I can see the hollowness inside of me and fill that back up. In the words of Rick Warren, you don't know God is all you need until God is all you have. I just hope to encourage everyone here to trust God with everything because surrendering brings freedom and only when you surrender to God can make uh, work miracles in your life. And also before I hand this to Mitchell Long, I just want to say thank you for being all of our role model. Words cannot describe your selfish love, uh, selfless love and hump. <laughs> your selfless love and humble knowledge. We look up to you as you strive to be more like Christ and we strive to be more like you. Thank you. She's just trying to get me crying before I come up here. Selfish love, my wife's accused me of that before. So how cool is this, huh? I mean, don't you wish Maxine had been in your youth group when you were younger? You got a kid who's on fire and is uh, getting other kids excited about it. And as she shared, there's, there's kids that have responded to Christ because of her reaching out. <clears throat> and yet, as Max, Maxine and I have talked over the last uh, half year, year, honestly, both of us feel like we're, we're just hanging on for the ride. That God's bringing all these things our way and we're just like, hold on, because here he goes and we go wherever he goes, and, and cool things are happening 
And it's not because of us, it's despite us that God intervenes and works through us. So it's really, really cool. <clears throat> I thought I'd just uh, share quickly three things that we've been going over as a youth group and that I think apply to adults as well. And I forget what order I put them in. So Evan, if you can click. Oh, there we go. All right. First thing I go over with the kids is this. We make this too difficult. This Bible thing and this God thing and faith in Christ has become too confusing. It's become too difficult for people. And as the church, we oftentimes get focused on all the wrong stuff. And uh, the, the best illustration of this was by one of my heroes, Ravi Zacharias, who shares a story of, um, of um, Holmes and Watson, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. They're going on a camping trip together and they set their tent up in this beautiful, peaceful field and they lay down and they go to sleep for the night. Middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes nudges Watson. Watson, what do you see up there? Watson goes, oh, stars. Sherlock Holmes goes, what does that tell you? Watson goes, well, astronomically, it tells me that there's lots of galaxies and billions of stars. Astrologically, it tells me that, that cancer is in Leo. Uh, theologically, it tells me that God is big and we are very small. Uh, horologically, it tells me it's about 2 o'clock in the morning. And meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day. Why, Holmes? What does it tell you? And he goes, Watson, you idiot. Someone stole our tent. <laughs> and, and it's funny, but that's what we do in the church. That's what we do in the church all the time. We make the, the message of the gospel so difficult for people to understand. We get caught up in all the minute things that don't matter. Someone has stolen the tent. We need to get back to the basics here. And so one of the things I go over with the kids is just what is the basic message of the Bible? Jesus is interesting because he summarizes the whole of Scripture, the whole of the law, which was literally 1,000 to 2,000 different minute things that you had to follow, and he summarized it in two things. What were they? Come on, they're easy. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. And he said, if, if you can do those two things, you've got the law. You've got the whole thing. It's very simple. In terms of a scripture that simplifies what the Bible's teaching, uh, those of you that are my age and older remember that back in the day, and we've talked about this in the youth group, back in the day in the United States in football games, there was always somebody sitting in the end zone holding a big sign. And it said 316 on it which stood for John 3.16, and it was in almost every football game. You'd see it in hockey and baseball as well. You don't see it anymore, probably partly because there's a World Wrestling Federation champion named Austin 3.16, and so no one knows what it means anymore when they see the sign. Is that Austin or is that John? John 3.16, most well-known verse, not the easiest to memorize. The easiest to memorize is Jesus wept. But the most well-known verse, John 3:16, what does it say? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we, we have this, if you go into the youth group room, we have this verse drawn up on the, on the wall. And basically what the Bible message is, is there's a divide between us and God. And we need him. And the only way to cross that divide is through Jesus. That's it. And so we go over this time and again in class. You know, uh, one of the things that's always been hurled against Christians, and I've heard it myself, is your religion or your faith in Jesus is a crutch. It's a crutch. You need it to get through life. And I say, yes, I do. In fact, it, it's not a crutch. There was a guy from Resurrection Band. That puts you back in the 70s. And he had a great statement that, that I understand completely. I, my dad's a medical doctor. I grew up in a hospital not sick, just hanging out in the hospital. <laughs> and I'll tell you that you know this, when people are on crutches, it takes a lot of effort for them to get down the hallway. But uh, our faith in Christ is not a crutch, because on our own effort, we don't even get down the hallway, right? It's not a wheelchair. You can wheelchair a wheelchair by yourself. It is really a stretcher. Our faith in Christ is, is an absolute, as the picture showed, it's an absolute surrender. And it's Christ coming alongside and picking us up and getting us through life because of what he's done in our hearts. So that's the first thing we covered. The second thing we cover in youth group is 
<clears throat> God is not afraid of your questions. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm only a young 43 years old, but the longer I go through life, the more unimpressed I am with the challenges that come against the faith in terms of the secular world. The questions I hear, and I, I, I've spent a lot of time reading The God Delusion and God is Not Great, and all these books that are written by these intellectual experts of the atheist field. And I will tell you that I'm, I'm not, I have not been impressed by the debate that is out there. Uh, it, it requires a great deal of faith to believe that there is no God, which is very ironic. And these guys, these, these teenagers are going into a world, as Maxine said, that is probably as relativistic as we've seen in a long time. Not the most relativistic we've ever seen. As uh, Mr. Gertis shared back in the Old Testament, we see some pretty crazy stuff going on in Genesis and, in, and when you look in the Kings and you look at Judges, and you see verses time and time again. There's one in Judges that says, there was no king in the land, therefore the people did what was right in their own eyes. Whatever they wanted to do, they did because they had no king. And quite frankly, that's what we're seeing in the world today because there is no truth, no capital T truth to base your decisions on. Moral relativism takes hold. And so it's not surprising, it should not be surprising to us that people are lost and wandering in a, in a very relativistic uh, land right now. And that should also um, encourage us again to pray for these guys because they're encountering uh, perspectives that are very difficult to argue about because there is no truth. And one of the great ironies in relativism is that the only thing that is true is that there is no truths. And you can understand the irony in that statement. If that's true, then that's not true. And round and round we go. And so we see a world where teenagers in particular are just very confused. And we got to pray for them and, and uh, keep lifting them up. The Bible <clears throat> answers the difficult questions of life. It does. We've talked about this in the youth group. We had a couple. It was a one-question Sunday that turned into about a four-question Sunday. And what was interesting to me as I, as I talked with these guys is the questions are changing. Uh, I taught a Sunday school class probably 15 years ago now, and the questions were all about inerrancy of Scripture, um, whether Jesus was God or not, those kind of questions. The questions are changing. There are a lot more questions about if this is true, then how do we interact in this world that we see? And so they're, they're, they're interesting uh, challenges, and yet the Bible sets it up for us to understand exactly how to act in this time. I remember, some of you will remember from the time you were really little, in Sunday school class, you sang that song, The Bible Stands on a Firm Foundation mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with a truth eternal, and they glow with a, life, a light sublime. You remember this song, anyone? Or am I the only one that was old school? Uh, no one else sat in pews and used the hymnal? Brad, all right, good. It's true. The Bible does stand over time. The challenges that exist now can be answered in the pages of the Bible and in the person of Jesus. And if you will take time to look at that, and take time to really explore that, I think you'll find that to be true. You need to remember, too, that the world must offer an answer. You can't just ask all the questions. Hitchens talks about this in, in, in uh, God is Dead. He hurls insult after insult after insult on the, on the Christian church and on the belief in Jesus, and he does not answer the questions that he accuses them of doing a poor job at answering. You must answer the questions for yourself. If not this, then what? And that, I think, is the challenge that we can approach the world with as well. Finally, be a part of history, all right? This is actually a Louis Giglio uh, idea. He uses his story, being a part of history. And what we talk about in youth group is, again, if you go in the youth group room, you'll see a line drawn on the wall, and it extends in both directions, as lines do whereas line segments have a beginning and an ending. You guys know this. Am I right? It's been a while for me. So lines extend in both directions, and there we are right in the middle of it. Or maybe not. We don't know exactly where we are. In, 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 uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But there we sit, and the things that we focus on as being so important 
and such big deals really pale in comparison to God who's looking down on how all this is unfolding and God who has his hand in taking charge of everything that happens in light of history. And my big challenge to the kids and, and to us as adults is we have to be, we can sit there and focus on the problems and the things that are difficult for us to understand or we can say, you know what, I'm here, he's put me here and I'm gonna be part of his story wherever I'm at. Now for me, I, I gotta tell you that, that right now as a, as a teacher at TAS, and uh, many of you know, I've shared with the youth group before, that I, I feel very strongly that God gave me the job at Type American School. And he did not give me the job so that I could get wealthy and run around a track and hang out and teach health and PE, even though it is the best job in the world. In fact, I always tell my students, I'm actually the smartest teacher in the school, if you think about it. <laughs> I don't grade, you grade papers? I don't grade papers. Who's the smart one, right? <laughs> but he did not give me that job. He did not give you your job. Kids, he did not put you in school so that you can just sit there and do time and get through life. First of all, we don't know how long we have. We studied that uh, about three weeks ago when we talked about um, this accident that happened in Green Island over spring break. We don't know how long we have. And so the real challenge for us is, okay, God, I'm here right now, right here. What do you want me to do? And how can I impact my world for you? You can tell Maxine's got that. She understands that. And she's not doing time. She's going, okay, here I'm at, and now I need to be reaching out and witnessing and being an example and praying for people and letting God work through me rather than just hanging out. So I think that's a good challenge for all of us as well. God sees things from a, a much different uh, perspective. He says in 1 Corinthians that we see things very, in, like in a fog, we see things like there's, like there's a film across the mirror. After you get taken, done taking a shower, you try to look in the mirror, you can't see yourself. And he says, that's how you see things right now. But someday, we're going to see things a lot more clearly. And we have faith that God's in charge, and he's got this thing in his control. And the mirror's going to be wiped nice and clear. We go, oh, that's why that thing happened in my life. That's why you put me there. And we don't want it to be, oh, that's why you put me there. I thought it was just so I could hang out. So that's really a challenge, I think, for all of us as well. So in closing, um, I just want to echo what Maxine said. Please pray for these guys. We've got a bunch of seniors going to college. We've had seniors go to college. Some have done very well. Some have not done so well. And the key is them getting plugged in, getting plugged into the InterVarsity or Bible study group somewhere in these universities. Every university in the U.S., no matter how secular uh, they are, have a group of Christian kids. They're smart kids, and they're, uh, they're, they're kids that are trying to make a difference within those schools. And so we need to pray that these guys get plugged in. We need to pray for some of these uh, high school kids that have been exposed to the gospel and not responded yet. Because once they get to college, they're, they're, we know from, from looking at research and people coming to the Lord, the older you wait, the less likely it is. And kids that can be impacted when they're young have a higher, ch higher uh, rate of response when it comes to responding to the Lord, which is kind of ironic because I find that the older you get, the more you realize you need God. When you're young, you know, I, I was invincible when I was 20. And now I'm like, oh God, please, <laughs> things are changing. So pray for these guys as they do that and um, pray, for, pray for me, for others in the, in the church that are involved with the teenagers because uh, honestly, we're just hanging on and God's doing a really cool thing among these teenagers. So we're going to close in prayer and then we're going to sing some songs and then we're going to go fellowship. Thank you, God, for meeting with us. Thank you for the words that were shared by Mr. Gertis, the challenge as we look back into Genesis, all the stories we heard when we were in Sunday school as kids, and uh, sometimes we forget that they are still true and they're still applicable to our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us to respond uh, to the word of your, uh, uh, to your word. Thank you, Lord, for what Maxine shared. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, honor these prayers for these kids to put a hedge around them as they go to college, to encourage them in their faith, to give them opportunities to run into people who also uh, love and serve you, who are um, able to answer the difficult questions. And I just pray, Lord, that a year from now when we see them again, that we'll be just uh, stoked by how much you've done in their life uh, while they've been gone. And uh, Lord, I just pray also 
for those who have not yet responded to you, that, that they would turn their hearts and soften their hearts and re respond to the gift that you so freely offer to us. And we're uh, humbled, Lord, by all you've done uh, in our lives, and we just thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name.